I think there's a few more that will join us um, in a few minutes, but they can watch the recording to catch up. Okay, right. cool. okay great. Thank you, very much. thank you. Okay, thank you, Emma. Um, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Nolan Williams uh, from the RiskConsultancy.com. I'm the CEO of the Risk Consultancy, which is a company that offers uh, training, in-house training, uh, consultancy. Uh, we also do uh, seminars and workshops in fraud risk management, uh, security risk, and also operational risk management. Now, today we are going to be talking about um, uh, a topic that is relevant to fraud risk management. Uh, and that topic is uh, fraud risk assessment. Now, I know some of you are probably thinking, oh my God, fraud risk assessment. And actually, if you are thinking that way, it's good. Because this is generally the type of reaction that you would get um, from organizations when you sort of mention fraud risk uh, assessment. Because they see it as a very simple exercise. And it is. It could be. And, and pretty much it should be a simple exercise. But that's only if you get a true and thorough understanding of uh, the elements or the makeup of the things that actually makes a very good uh, fraud risk assessment. And that's what today's webinar is all about. Today I'm gonna, um, we're going to discuss uh, about the elements, uh, the tips, the ways, and the trends or the things that you need to consider or embrace um, when you are actually um, in the process of carrying out uh, your fraud risk uh, management or your fraud, fraud risk assessment processes. So you're going to understand um, what is fraud risk, uh, what are the type of elements um, we should sort of think about, um, how to approach it, uh, how to embrace it, and how to pretty much establish um, and, and, and sort of maintain on an ongoing process, uh, a method that would enable, enable our fraud risk assessment process to be um, sort of relevant, you know, because this is something that you have to keep relevant and in tune with the changes within your organization. So with no further ado, I'll jump straight into it. And of course, what we're going to look at is what, uh, what is a fraud risk assessment. Um, please don't shoot me. And you know, for some of you, you're probably not going to use because this is something that you, you probably know. But as you know, with any strong structure, you, you have to start with a good foundation. So this is pretty much uh, what I have in mind and how I'm going to approach it. Um, when we're thinking about progress, it's very simple, as I said. Um, progress assessment is simply a, a process of um, proactively identifying and addressing um, your vulnerability uh, towards internal and external fraud. That is all that there is to it. It's just a proactive. And I want to stress on the word proactive because when, when, when you speak to most organizations, and that's globally about fraud, um, depending on your area of function, it's, most of uh, them seem to think, okay, well, you know, fraud is not a big issue here. We, you know, we don't have many cases of fraud, so we don't need to think about this. Um, from my experience over the years of, of working with several uh, institutions throughout the world, um, that is not the case. And, and the key word here is to proactively engage in a process that will enable you to incorporate or to think about the necessary controls that you need to think about in regards to the fraud risk that is relevant to your institution. So it's, it's simply a, 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 a proactive way of um, identifying and addressing the, your vulnerabilities. And of course, the next questions would be, what are the benefits of a fraud risk assessment? Now, identifying and addressing uh, your vulnerabilities of internal and external fraud has a lot of benefits. The first thing to note is that pretty much a one size or one outfit do not actually fit every organization because every organization faces its own risks. And of course, we know that is pretty much dependent on um, the type of business you are, 
the environment that you operate in, um, the regulatory body that is responsible for uh, governing you, um, the changes to the products and services that you offer, and, and of course, the state of your financial um, uh, environment as well. So because of these factors and because that each environment sort of um, faces its own unique risk, when you're thinking about the risk assessment, think of something that is tailored and shaped towards the organization within which you function. And of course, what gets evaluated and how it gets assessed is what we should be concentrated on. It's what we should be tailoring to, to, to our specific needs, so to speak. And of course, additionally, um, fraud risk is a continually changing thing. So the method that we embrace, our approach towards uh, our risk assessment activities has to be kept or has to change, has to go with the changing times, with a changing environment. So um, this is something that um, we should consider at all times and keep that at the back of our mind when we are thinking of putting together a framework upon which we are going to be conducting uh, our fraud risk uh, assessment. So the process has to be relevant and it has to be, it has to evolve. You know, you have to take it and, and, and run with the changes as it goes. So never ever um, in any situation try to stick to a, a particular format that you may have felt that was very effective. So we should always think of uh, the changes that we need to think of and evaluate. So we cover that just to go over these points. So it improves um, communications, of course, that's one of the main benefits. Because you see, within um, the activity of, of uh, your risk assessment, one of the crucial and beneficial things that we should try and establish at the start is to communicate our actions within the organization in regards to our fraud risk assessment exercise. The reason for doing that is because it engages um, the whole population, the staff. It gets them to be involved. So communicating your process, what you're doing, how you're doing it, and how you plan to uh, go about um, getting the necessary information that you require is very, very important. And in this process, what that does is actually get everybody within the organization to start thinking about fraud. Okay? It also helps you to identify activities as well. Um, it enables you to, to, to know who puts you at risk, which is pretty much your, your main objective, um, not just who, but um, the products and services, uh, what sort of risk are uh, inheritance uh, within those fields, within those environments. Um, and of course, it also helps you uh, to develop uh, a plan to mitigate the risk. Now, I'm sure that most of you know this, but the whole purpose or objective of actually carrying out the risk assessment is to identify the risk, that would, which will then in turn be able to allow you to put together the necessary internal controls to actually protect your organization. Um, moving forward, what makes a good fraud risk assessment? The right sponsors. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress this enough. Because often what you find is that companies or institutions throughout the world they do have a risk assessment. They do have a fraud risk management program. Some of it are incorporated as part of the overall um, risk assessment um, program or exercise. Others are standalone um, functions. Uh, and those are specific to, in, uh, to institutions who would uh, pretty much want to concentrate on a particular um, sort of risk area, so to speak. But irrelevant of what approach you take, irrelevant of who actually owns um, the activity. It is vitally important that at all times we get the support of the, the sponsor or of the board, so to speak. We must buy in 
to management support. Because once that is established, all of the other things that you need to do becomes much, much, much more easier. So bear that in mind, keep that in mind, and if there are any of you who are struggling with your fraud risk management program, I need you to take a step back and, and think of why that is so. And the first area that I would advise you to, to revisit to see if you are actually um, you know, crossing the T's and dotting the I's is to question yourself and ask yourself, am I getting the support from the board? And that is a very um, crucial and critical starting point. And if you are, you can then take it from there. And of course, what also makes a good fraud risk uh, assessment is uh, independent objectivity. The reason why you're putting a team together to gather the, the information that you so require is to put yourself in a position to see, see um, the whole scope of the, the, the risk environment that you are operating in. That sort of independent um, sort of view. And you will get that from the people that you incorporate into that process. And, and of course, the aim of that is to offer that objectivity when you are going through the process of assessing the risk that is relevant to you. Of course, uh, another a good factor of that is a good working knowledge of the business. Now, a risk assessment allows you to understand every intricate detail and working processes of the various business sector, uh, the various products or the various services that you offer. If it's done correctly, if it's approached correctly, if you choose the correct method of actually acquiring the, the necessary information, this is what such an approach will en enable you to do. And last but not least, of course, it allows you access to the people of all levels. Now, again, I cannot stress this. Um, I mean, there's no other way I can, I, I can stress this, the importance of this because this exercise creates that opportunity for you to speak to the, the board of directors, down to the, the latest recruit that would have joined the company. So it's very, very important. And creating that communication, establishing that communication, builds awareness amongst everybody. So at a certain point, you know, indirectly, what that does as well, it also creates like a, um, a perception of protection. You, you sort of create a perception like that we care. You know, fraud and fraud risk is something that will never be tolerated within this business. This is uh, one of the great benefits of your fraud risk assessment exercise. It creates that awareness. It allows people to think, okay, well, if they are actually taking um, such a serious step, based on the question they're asking, the information that they're providing, it means that, you know, I really can't take a chance. So therefore, it is really important for me to play my part, play my role in terms of actually preventing fraud. So it, 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 it's very, 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 very important. Um, continuing on, trust. Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, this is, this is um, Trust is not something that can be ordered. It's not something that you can buy. Um, I cannot give you trust and, and instruct you to go and, 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 and take it through um, your, your, your staff or your, your committee meetings. Trust is something that you have to build. Trust is something that you, you have to, to, to nurture. And you play a big, big part in how you actually go about constructing that trust. And it's a deliberate effort to develop that whole. So if you are directly involved in the risk assessment process of your company, one of the things I will strongly advise you to do is to create that atmosphere whereby you encourage your staff to speak to you. Often or not, the staff or the people who's working on the front line actually knows what's going on in regards to fraud 
or fraudulent activities. And if you cannot tap into that information, if you cannot find an avenue, a venue, or a way of actually getting that information from them, you could see where you are actually putting yourself at a very, very big disadvantage. So being able to create that sort of fear of, of trust is very, very important. So think carefully, think wisely, um, be deliberate in how you approach and communicate with uh, your entire staff when it comes to um, the, the, the exercise or the process of your fraud risk assessment. And of course, it's important to understand that having a clue is no excuse. And what, what, what I mean about this is, when we think about most fraudulent events that occurs or takes place within an organization, very often they happen so very close to us. As a matter of fact, sometimes we are actually part of the, the fraudulent process and we don't realize. That is simply because we didn't think or expect the person who would have perpetrated the, 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 the crime to, to have done so. So what we're saying here is to think the unthinkable. Don't think that it's not going to happen to, to me or to us, or we don't have such a such, such sort of um, behavior here. It is not about that. It's about positioning yourself to think the unthinkable. As a fraud investigator, one of the things that they taught us uh, as, a, as a part of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners is whenever you are investigating fraudulent events or fraudulent matters, you always have to prove that there isn't fraud before you can prove that there is fraud. So you, you sort of approach it from the opposite direction. The same principle uh, or process applies as someone who's been tasked with the oversight responsibilities of carrying out a fraud risk assessment. Always think the unthinkable. Always put yourself in a position that you are aware. Educate yourself. So not being aware of the fraudulent schemes, not being aware of the ways in which someone can commit fraud, not being aware of your company's um, internal control weaknesses is not an excuse. So be objective and think the unthinkable. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, you have to keep your fraud risk assessment process alive and it must be relevant. Very often what happens to some companies is that they would establish a framework that would have worked at maybe five, six months previous, and it could have produced the results that it wanted. It would have identified the fraud risk, both inheritance fraud risk and um, residual fraud risk. Um, and of course, what that would have meant is that they, you would have been able to, to implement and incorporate the necessary controls. But like I said before, it is vitally important to continue to review the processes, review your environment, review your internal controls, check if it's effective, check how it's working, check with the people around you. And the only way to do that is to maintain that method of communication that would allow your staff to freely offer information that would enable you to create such an environment. So remember, keep it live, keep it relevant, and keep it going. It should not be a, a, a one hat off uh, sort of activity. It should be repetitive, periodical. Of course, that will be will be determined based on your the setup of your organization and how often you choose to do it as well. So, developing an effective fraud risk assessment. Of course, this is something that um, will take time, like any building under construction. It goes through phases and stages. Um, and at some point in time, within any given uh, construction uh, building, there are some parts of the building that will be weak. And, but as you continue to, to grow and put the infrastructure in place, it becomes stronger and stronger. So bear that in mind. In some cases, you will not get it um, completely right the first time around. So it's an ongoing process. As a matter of fact, that's why it needs to be an ongoing process. Um, 
So what I would advise people is to package it right. Like I said, make sure that the package is right. And, and pretty much what I mean with this is, say for example, um, you take an IT company or you take a, a research company, for example. And generally, if you, if you think of the makeup of such institutions, they deal with numbers um, compared to, say, um, a company like myself, the risk consultancy. We deal with um, speaking to people. We deal with an open process or method of communication. Whenever you are carrying out a risk assessment, it is vitally important that you speak to your staff in the same language which the business operates on a day-to-day -day level. The moment you try to change uh, the language that you are speaking to your staff with because you're carrying out a risk assessment, then you're looking for trouble. Because pretty much your staff or the, 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 the greater member of, of, of the business would not understand where you're coming from or even more so why the change. So package it right, make sure you, you, you get that correctly. Get the support from the board of directors um, or your sponsors, so to speak, from the top down. And remember, one size don't fit all. Very often we have so many uh, frameworks. Uh, for example, we have ISO, we have um, COSO. Those are frameworks that offer us uh, a blueprint, so to speak. But remember, it would not actually um, be sufficient or fit every organization because every organization functions differently in a different field, sells different products, and actually inherits different fraudulent risk. So it may be a case where you may have to either adapt or adopt. Whichever you choose, just make sure that it fits to your specific needs. And of course, keep it simple. Sometimes we fall into a lot of problems, a lot of trouble, simply because we, we, we try to make it too complicated. But you have to make things simple so that people can um, read or go through uh, within five, 10 minutes or even less. So whatever policies um, that you, you construct or you put together that sort of guide or um, you know, educate your staff on the fraud and risk assessment process, make sure to keep it simple. A leaflet maybe, uh, you know, anything like that. Emails, stuff like that actually works. So now we've sort of gone through uh, the basics or the elements that actually makes up a, a good fraud risk assessment. We still have to go through the process of, of doing it. So we're going to talk about um, how to prepare for a fraud risk assessment. And the first thing we're going to look at is uh, assembling the right team. Now, for some organization, you would have one individual depending on the size, or you'd have several. Now, this is just a, a guideline and with tips. So it depends on, on what, uh, or, you know, what makes up your, 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 your sort of uh, environment. You don't necessarily have to take into consideration these people. But it's advisable to have someone from the accounting and finance side, simply because uh, they are trained in management accounts they understand the pros, the cons, the concepts, and very often they pretty much know the standard operating procedures of uh, the internal controls that are in place as a result of the risk that they face. So it's always advisable or a good practice to um, include somebody from accounting and finance. Um, of course, non-financial business unit is another good person to, to, to acquire an individual from because, again, they give a different perspective. They give a different look, a different take of um, the risk that you are likely to face as well. And, of course, someone from risk management um, is always someone to consider. Um, but like I said, there isn't any specific single amount of people that you can include. It is all based up or determined by the size of your organization um, and the resources, of course, that you also have to play with. That is, that is also very, very important. Um, um, and also included is the general counsel. Now, we need not to emphasize too much on that because we need the advice, the legal advice of uh, the legal team. 
when it comes to discussing and assessing certain risk as well. So again, this is just a uh, general guideline, so don't take it as uh, finished uh, words or finished recommendations at all. Um, then we need to de de determine the best techniques. And with this, like I sort of spoke of earlier, what we'll be looking at is trying to um, employ a method that would allow us to be, as a team, as the, as the risk management team, or oh, sorry, risk assessment team, to be effective, to be able to draw from our staff the necessary required information to enable us to, to analyze and, and, and assess the risk that, is, um, that surrounds us, that is relevant to us. And there are several ways we can go about that. The first is interviews. Um, it's a very effective way of gathering information or getting information. Um, the only thing you have to consider about this is that sometimes when you are engaging in an interview with members of staff and you mention the word fraud, they automatically can think or may think or do think at times that they are being watched or you know they're being scrutinized upon. So we have to be careful as to how we structure uh, such interviews. So it's, 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 but that's something that I can cover at a later um, stage. Um, another method that is very effective is focus groups. Now, I pretty much prefer this method, um, and I will tell you why. When we, when you put on a focus group, uh, discuss, discussing fraud, as to say, um, of course you would sort of. Um, uh, guide the questions that you open to the group to get a particular answer. But what it does is that it gets a group of people together and allows them to speak openly in an open forum. So first they don't feel alone, they don't feel that they're singled out, and also they don't feel that the, 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 the focus and attention is on them alone. And what that does is it allows people to speak, it also allows them to listen, learn, and react to the input of uh, their, their colleagues or co-workers. Then as, a, as observers, what you would then do is then notice uh, the topics or the areas that is of greater importance to you. And then after a focus group um, program or session or meeting, you can then select individuals that you would like then like to further um, carry out personal interviews with. So it's very effective. It takes the pressure off the people that's participating and it allows you to sort of pay attention or uh, get a, a wider range of feedback from your staff members. Um, of course, there is surveys as well. This is a, also a very um, non-intrusive way of getting information from your staff in regards to uh, fraud and fraud risk management, particularly fraud risk assessment questionnaire. And of course, um, anonymous feedback mechanism. These are numerous. You could have emails, um, you could have flyers. Uh, if you have like a general area that everybody, you know, tend to have lunch or gather for lunch, you could, you know, stick up posters, just asking questions, getting people to, to, to fill them out and stick them back in a box. Um, and they're very effective. But the idea is here is to try and and stick to the method that is most effective or that will allow you to be most effective in getting the information um, that you need. Uh, uh, moving on, we're going to be um, talking about how to obtain sponsor's agreement or sponsor's agreement. And again, if we shall recap, sponsor's agreement is ab about getting the, the buy-in from those in the, at the head, at the top of the organization. So it's all about tapping in, creating a culture, tapping into that culture, and allowing that culture to, to drive your fraud risk management program, and so as a result, drive your fraud risk uh, assessment uh, exercise uh, and all processes. So when we talk about getting sponsors agreement, what, we, what are we actually thinking of, or what are we concentrating about, is the scope of work. We need to let them know what we are thinking of the activities that we are, we are uh, thinking of including to, in our fraud risk assessment um, 
process. The methods, surveys, interviews, etc. those are the methods that are going to be used to get that information. And of course, the individuals that we are targeting, who, we, who are we going to, to speak to? You know, the focus group, the interviews, the surveys, who exactly within the organization that we are thinking of actually approaching uh, and consulting with to get that information from. Um, and also the content of the chosen method, that is very important. Um, you just can't take any old information or any old content and, or questions and, and, and put it on a piece of paper and say, there you go guys, fill it out. It doesn't work. You have to be specific and it must be tailored and, and delivered in such a way to give you the required uh, information that you're looking for. So very important, that point, uh, make sure we keep it in mind. Um, continuing on, um, also, the fraud, like I said, the fraud risk assessment uh, framework, it has to be tailored. And in tailoring, what it means, what I mean, is it has to be structured um, in its approach. Um, you must be rational and make sure that um, that the events or activities that you do is, is designed to enable you to, first of all, identify the risk, um, to, to, to be able to analyze the risk, and as a result, it will, as an end result, it will be, uh, enable you to be able to put um, internal controls in place and help you to put remedial action in place as well. Um, this is exactly what I just covered there, performing evaluation and reporting. Uh, reporting is very important because um, there are some organizations that will carry out a fraud risk assessment program, but fall short of the required standard by the regulatory because the way it's reported um, was, was so much more below the level that was required. And so as a result of that, um, the managers or the, 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 the shareholders don't actually get a full picture of the risk that um, individual institutions are facing. So be careful with um, when you're compiling your fraud risk assessment report. It needs to, to be done in a particular way, a specific way that actually captures uh, the results that you would have evaluated. Very important here. Um, like I said, uh, there are two methods you can take, which is a qualitative uh, method, and it's also a quantitative method as well. But as I, I expressed earlier, it's, it's vitally important to stick to the method, stick to the language that you're accustomed to speak within your organization to get the best result possible. Generally, what I would advise most companies, where it's feasible, is to include uh, these two methods. So there are areas where you may need to um, um, include a lot of numbers or make reference to numbers. And if that gets your point across, if, get, if that gets your question answered, of course, include it by all means. Um, this is just a, a, a sample framework. Let's go through it. Product assessment framework. Um, again, this is just a blueprint. It's not something that needs to be followed um, word by word. But however, saying that, it is, this is pretty much what most of the um, uh, sort of blueprint of frameworks uh, covers. Like, for example, COSO, this is some what they recommended. And with this framework, what you're looking to do is to identify the inherent risk. Um, and then after that process, what we're looking to do is to assess the likelihood of those risks and assess the significance and then from that process, we, we look into evaluate both the people and departments and the methods of uh, those risks, how those risks affect those people. And then from there, you'll be either looking to consider preventative and detective control measures, uh, and then you'll be looking to monitor the, its effectiveness, its efficiency, and take into consideration the residual risk as well. So. Um, if we look at that in how it should be, this is just an example. So in the far left hand side, you can see the uh, fraud risk schemes. So you then identify the specific schemes that is very um, relevant to your business, uh, your industry, size, etc. And then you look at the likelihood. And pretty much what you're saying, 
as a business, as an institution, am I likely or are we likely to um, fall victim to any of these fraud schemes? And so that's, that's, that's what the likelihood assessment is all about. Um, and if we do, how significant would be the loss? That's the significance factor. And then from there, we will take, as explained earlier, the people and departments, how it affects that. Um, and then most importantly, we need to look at our existing controls, our existing anti-fraud controls that we have in place. See how they measure up, see how effective they are in terms of the identified risk, and look at if anything needs to be done to strengthen um, that particular area. And if so, then you will take the necessary uh, measures and actions to do so. Um, and so this is just, uh, just an example. But of course, whenever we are assessing the risk, one of the uh, areas to start at is incentive, pressure, and opportunity. It is vitally important that we look at the, 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 the fraud risk that is as a result of um, these things. Very often, um, as employees, I mean, I, I have been subject to this as well, we find ourselves working towards meeting targets. There are targets, there are boundaries, there are targets that we have to meet. And it all depends on your line manager and also the culture of the company. Because if the focus is predominantly on meeting your target, what that does is create or gives, I mean, if you understand the fraud triangle, which one element is pressure, one element is opportunity, and the other element is rationalization. So when we create or when we allow ourselves to, to install in our employee that element of pressure, simply because that we want he or she to perform to meet targets, we have to be very careful with that such approach. How much pressure is too much pressure? And that is something that we, we, we need to, to, to take into consideration at all times. And in doing that, we have to look at our incentive program. If you have one, it is you know, advisable or critical to have a look at your program and see how it actually, does it um, encourage fraud or does it um, sort of, you know, would it put somebody off from actually committing fraud? Very often you would find that it actually encourages fraud. Because if targets are not met, um, for example, in the sales team, if you don't meet your target, you don't have certain um, level-based commission coming in, you would look at the next action to, to, to meet those targets, and that will encourage you to, to you know, consider fraudulent activity. So that's one area we have to look at, and, and in doing so, like I said, we need to concentrate on our incentive program. Um, pressure to achieve performance, we covered that. Um, also, opportunities to commit fraud. Now, this is all about the control environment within your organization. Are there any opportunities that will allow your, 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 your workers to easily manipulate? Um, again, like I said, don't forget, this is the, the sole reason why you're carrying out a risk assessment, to be able to identify the risk, to be able to implement controls, to eliminate the opportunities that you so offer to your employees. Very often, the only reason why people come in fraud is because we as businesses allow them to, because our controls are weak or because we are applying too much pressure through our incentive programs. Um, and or, you know, the rationalization part comes very easily because human beings would always find a reason to justify their action. So we have to be very careful in regards to how we sort of uh, approach these things within our business. And of course, uh, weak internal controls. Um, moving on, another critical area that we must pay absolute attention to is management override controls. This, ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress this enough. This is vitally important. Put it this way. It's almost like, who is watching the police watch us? In other words, 
management are the ones who develop the controls, they develop the procedures, they develop code of ethics, you know, the, 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 the fraud risk management policy, they write them, they create them. They understand the standard operating procedure of the business. They also have a level of authority because they are trusted individuals. So as a result of that, it is crucially important for your fraud risk assessment to take into consideration management override controls because they are in the perfect position to manipulate or cook the books, so to speak. And that is one of the biggest risks that we face, and there is no getting the way around it. Like I said, management is knowledge, knowledgeable uh, of controls and SOPs, um, something that they may use uh, to conceal fraudulent acts. Um, and of course, they are often regarded as the most trusted um, who's watching us or who's watching management. And of course, there is a fraudulent financial reporting as well. Um, who's cooking the books? They are cooking the books. Um, these two, the previous slide and these slides actually link uh, very nicely. Um, and some of the, the areas to look at when you're considering fraudulent financial reporting risk is uh, the inappropriately reporting of revenues, um, inappropriately reflected balance sheets and amounts, uh, of course, inappropriately improved or masked disclosures, concealed misappropriation of assets, concealed unauthorized receipts, uh, concealed unauthorized acquisition. These are just some areas. There is, of course, a lot more, but these are just some key areas that uh, we need to take our attention to and pay a lot of attention to, of course. Um, the next area is asset misappropriation. Some of the risks involved there are tangible assets um, and also intangible assets, um, property, business opportunities, excuse me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, there is corruption, another area that we, we need to, to pay uh, greater attention to. Now, admittedly, there are some areas um, that would be more, um, uh, that would suffer um, more as far as uh, corruption, fraudulent schemes are concerned than others. That's not to say that uh, some areas are more vulnerable than some, because corruption, given the right environment, given the right opportunities, given the, the, the appropriate lack of internal control, anyone can become a corrupted uh, employee. So, um, but some of the schemes that we, we need to take into consideration uh, are bright, and gratuities to companies, those are very common. Um, of course, uh, private individuals or public officials are also susceptible uh, to that as well. Um, receipt of bribes, kickbacks or gratuities are all common schemes. And aiding and abetting of fraud. Moving on, we also need to take into consideration regulatory and legal misconduct. There are also um, certain risks involved there. And one of the most common is uh, conflict of interest. Uh, we all talk about that, I'm sure, in our business, and we all understand that. <laughs> is someone saying something? No? Okay. Inside the trading? Um, test of competitors, trade secrets, and anti-competitive practices as well. Um, of course, we also have reputational risk. Um, we know how important our reputation is. Our reputation is our wealth. Um, and with our reputational risk, we are focusing our customers, suppliers, um, capital markets, and others as well. There's also the risk of information technology which include hacking, economic espionage, um, web deficiency, and sabotage of data, and authorized and unauthorized access to data as well. Now, employing a fraud risk assessment. Now, we know how important this is, so we have to put it in place and make sure that it gets through. 
first of all, we talk about assessing the likelihood of occurrence. We went through that, so we need to consider past instances of occurrence. Uh, of course, the prevalence of the fraud risk, um, internal control environment, something that we need to take into consideration, um, resources available to address fraud, and of course, the next step would be assessing the occurrence. These are the things we need to pay attention to. Um, support of fraud prevention efforts, critical ethical standard of the organization. Now, I can't stress on that. This is very, very important. Um, some companies do have an ethics program in place. However, the activities or, or the, the, the measures to actually make sure that that is communicated, make sure that that is relevant and proactively acted upon, sometimes becomes uh, an exercise that gets pushed to the back or fall by the wayside. So we must make sure that um, our ethics program is also equally communicated as our fraud risk management program as well. A uh, number of individuals uh, transaction involved, um, these are numbers, complexity of the fraud risk that we are facing, and of course, continuing on, the number of people that is involved in reviewing and approving um, business processes. That is very critical, very important. Um, unexplained losses, something to consider, complaint by customers or vendors, and information from fraud surveys as well. Financial statements and monetary significance, that's also very important. Financial conditions of the organization, value of the threatened assets, and criticality to the threatened assets, and assessing the significance of the progress. Uh, revenues generated by the threatened assets and brand value and expectation. But ladies and gentlemen, in total, what I'm saying is your progress assessment um, exercise needs to be um, thought about. A lot of thought needs to go into it in terms of how you plan it, um, the resources that you're looking to, 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 to um, get from it, the information, the people that you are planning to speak to, is vitally, vitally, vitally important. So either way, um, it is critical that we pay a lot of attention to our fraud risk assessment. Don't look at it as a, a very simple exercise. Put the thought, put the resources, and put the time into it. And over time, what will happen is that you will begin to sort of um, form a, an approach that will enable you to keep on top of the fraud risk that is uh, threatening your organization. Now, I know we are running out of time, um, and we don't have much time left for question and answers. So I will stop here and open the floor to anyone who would like to fire some questions at me. You can also fire the questions in the chat box as well. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling now then, um, and maybe a few more will step forward then. Uh, this might be a peculiar question, but do you think there's more opportunity of fraud occurring in a, a small organisation or a larger organisation? Because from what you've been discussing, um, that they, this is quite, um, the fraud risk assessment process is quite all encompassing. You've got to look at different departments. Um, it's not just finance, which I think a lot of people consider, um, but even like doing, carrying out due diligence when you're hiring new staff, um, it, it seems like that, you, you know, if it's a handful of money, you don't want them to have a criminal record for stealing. So I just wondered how, what you thought about that, if it's, the threat is, is greater in smaller or larger organisations. No, I, I wouldn't say the threat is smaller in a, in a larger, in a smaller organisation than a larger organisation. With fraud, um, every um, occurrence of uh, any fraudulent event is relevant to the size and um, makeup of any particular business. For example, if a Fortune 500 company loses 500 million, um, that's relevant to that company, uh, its environment, its operation, its setting, its financial um, sort of forecast. Um, 
So that is no greater than a fraud being perpetrated uh, with, a, with a sort of medium, small to medium um, categorized company at all. So this is why I said every organization needs to, need to take into consideration its environment, um, its products and services, its regulatory body, and the, the fraud risk that it is open to. Um, it is known, I mean, reports from the ACFE has shown that remedial loss, monetary loss from um, small to medium businesses has affected small companies much more or even just as, as, as great as the large companies. What you would find with the larger companies is that the type of fraud that is uh, being committed or perpetrated is of a different type. They tend to be more um, from owners and executives or people at the top of the organization tree. Um, and although those fraud schemes are, are few, the loss resulting from those schemes are much, much more than the amount that you will find in any small businesses. So although you do have to take into consideration a lot of things um, and a lot of consideration in terms of departments, people, and how you structure it, it may sound like cumbersome and difficult, but it's just a matter of, like you said, due diligence and taking the time to make sure that, first of all, your fraud risk assessment approach is structured um, and it, 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 it's aimed at you know, addressing and identifying a particular risk and getting the type of information that you need. What I would advise everybody is when you're thinking of overall fraud risk management, uh, an important um, area to look at is the culture of the, the business itself. Because if fraud is not a big issue or if the company seems to, per, to portray this perception or seems to have this perception that fraud really isn't a risk fact that they need to worry about, um, then no one else within the organization will take it seriously. That's number one. And secondly, those who have a need and those who find the opportunity and given the opportunity to, to, to perpetrate fraud will do so and do so without thinking about it. Thank you, Naima. Are there any other questions? I have another one for you, um, Nolan. In terms of legislation, do you think that's getting stricter now in, um, in terms of like people com and companies having to look more into fraud risk assessment? Do you think legislation is becoming um, stronger? Yes, I, I, think, I think they are becoming more stronger, um, especially since the, the financial meltdown. Now, what we have to bear in mind is that um, Often we try to, 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 to single out fraud risk um, and, and, and the effects of fraud risk, but I think it's crucial that we understand that fraud risk is a, a subcategory of operational risk. Now, when we think of op operational risk, operational risk is a risk type that is present in all risk sectors. So it's something that you, you really cannot avoid. It, it is just there. So as long as you have a business, and that business it consists of one to five employees, you automatically inherit operational risk. Um, and as we know, operational risk is uh, sort of the risk uh, of loss as against people, processes, uh, systems, and, and, and an outside event. So Basel has made certain recommendations in regards to operational risk management, and they have um, advised and, and, and stressed that organizations should pay more uh, qualitative measurement and approach towards operational risk. In other words, you know, actively, actively manage operational risk rather than um, providing measurement. So it's more a case of manage it than measure it. So, and as a result of those guidelines and as a result of those, those sort of pursuits and and push prods and encouragement from that particular regulatory body. I think most organizations now are paying a lot more attention to, to, to fraud risk, um, be simply because it's, it's now being seen as a, a major risk factor, so to speak. 
Um, in terms of how they approach the management of fraud risk, that is completely up to the company. Um, like I stressed, there's a lot of companies who has it as, as part of their overall um, risk management program, um, which there is nothing wrong with that, providing you're going to have, you're going to take a, a continuous uh, monitoring approach. Um, others have it as a standalone exercise, of course. That is also relevant to the business um, type or the corporate governance structure that that particular business chooses as well. So however you choose to, to assess the business risk of fraud is completely down to you. What is most important is that the results uh, or the, the activities discovered as a result of, of your risk assessment should be given a fair chance or a clear route uh, of escalation so that um, the board of directors, the shareholders um, have a true understanding of the type of risk that the business faces. Thank you. Okay. Um, is it possible that if anyone has any questions that they can actually send them to you directly? Yeah, sure. Sure they can. Okay. Um, anyone with anyone with any further questions, um, or you know, sometimes you're not able to think about it now, or or you may think of something that is relevant to your organisation in, in regards to what was um, shared here today. Um, feel free to um, pop it to Emma, and then Emma can get it to me, or vice versa. You can um, go to me online, email me, um, go to the website, uh, contact me there on my Facebook page or my LinkedIn page as well. There are several options, but um, feel free to, to email me and I will get back to you with a prompt answer. Thank you very much for your time, um, Nolan. Uh, very interesting, very broad subject as well. So thank you for uh, fitting into the hour. And um, yep, we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Okay, thank you very much, Emma. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good, a good day. Bye for now.